this table. Right. <laughs> I know, shame on me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you can you can take responsibility for that, but I think it was me. <laughs> Let's get started then. This is just a joint meeting about historical preservation. I'm going to turn it over to you. Does everybody know everyone here? Should we just go around and ask us their names or are we good? Yes. All right. Let's start. I'm Atasi Tetlow. I'm Assistant City Attorney with the City and I primarily advise public works, planning and development services, and uh, oil and gas. I'm Austin Flanagan. I'm one of your special counsel, particularly hired to so assist you guys in historic preservation and ordinance updates. I'm Glenn Daniel Wagon. I'm the planning director. I'm Jody Marsh, assistant city manager. Tim Water, city council. Aaron Rodriguez, city council. Marshall Martin, city council. Joe Ketley, city council. John Farner, HPC. Steve Lane, city chair. Holly Norton, HPC. Karen Sanders, HPC. Suzanne Sanders, HPC. And the lady. Shakita Yockworld, City Council. Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. And here comes Susie. Uh, Susie, yes. Uh, Jennifer Hewitt Apperson, uh, Planning and Staff. Shakita, this one right here. Brian Schumacher, City Planning. Council Member Susie Lovell Perry. Great. We're just getting started. Um, we have a gentleman there, are you and Mia. Are you just part of the public? It's just part of the public. <laughs> oh, you're the cameraman. Oh, the cameraman. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. LPU. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Glenn Van Nim. I'm going to shift it to a task. <laughs> <laughs> so good evening, Mayor Planning Council members, uh, members of the Historic Preservation Committee, just introduce myself. I work for the city uh, in the Assistant City Attorney's Office. And so I'm sitting in for Eugene tonight. He is in France, a uh, lucky guy. But uh, tonight we are going to be discussing the topics that are going to be oops, here we go, shown on slide two. This is our agenda for tonight. And we are going to be quickly recapping some of the background that um, both members of the Historic Preservation Committee and council members may have heard previously, I think in the past month or so. And then we're going to move on to larger, more substantive issues that you can see uh, in sections two through six. So the topics that are gonna be presented to you tonight are those that are primarily focused on um, some areas of concern that have been highlighted by our outside counsel, Austin from Hawkins Parker, as well as our uh, committee members from the Historic Preservation Committee and staff. And so with regard to just a brief, quick history of the project, HPC, our staff members, started working on revising the code amendments, just taking a look at some areas of concern last year, and that's when Hoffman Park was onboarded. And what we're gonna see tonight is what are the, the primary areas of concern. And as I mentioned, we've discussed them before. And so the options presented to you today are going to be legally defensible options. Um, they are going to be our recommended course of action um, as far as what we are going to suggest as far as code amendments. And so, Right now, as I mentioned, we looked at legally defensible options. We did not have AI out for policy issues, but you know, we welcome, we absolutely welcome feedback on those policy issues so we can more in so we can bring our code more in line with those legal concerns that we might bring up and any uh, direction that we receive from city council tonight. So it's our intention to try and get through um, some of uh, most of these topics in a tame direction on where city staff members and city attorney's office in Hoffman Park. Um, but if we don't hit them all, that's you know we get more than welcome. We're more than happy to come back at another date <coughs> to follow up on some of these. With that, I will turn it over to Austin. Thank you, Austin. All right, so we'll start with a brief overview of the legal framework in the U.S. for historic preservation. You have it at each level of government in the U.S. So it started in 1966 with the passage of the National. Preservation Act, and what that did was create the National Register and State Historic Preservation Offices, which 
are colloquially referred to as shibos. So at the state level, you have these shibos that administer the National Historic Preservation Program. Um, and a lot of what they do is actually in this last point here, it's that section 106 review, which is to ensure that um, historic resources are taken to a, in, into account anytime there's federal funding being spent. So I say all of that is a way of background, but of course today, what we're gonna be talking about is the local level, the Longmont's Historic Preservation Code. And this is really where a lot of the work for local, um, or for historic preservation is done, it's on the local level. So again, taking a step back before we dive into the some of the substance tonight. So why have a local historic preservation code generally? Of course, it's to protect historic buildings, to protect historically significant areas in a community. But what you'll also see with most historic preservation codes is what's talked about in these two bullet points. And we took these straight from the current um, code. And they have to do with enhancement of property values. They have to do with um, the financial gain that can be benefited from historically preserving buildings. More on that later. And actually, if I can get that. This is actually a picture of downtown Longmont. Um, let me back here. Oh, oh. <laughs> Okay, so we'll start with designation criteria. So when we say designation in the context of historic preservation, what we really mean is how you get into historic preservation, how you get into the historic preservation regulations. It's another word of saying rezoning. Um, in each one of these um, issues, we'll talk about some of the current language, and then we'll talk about, again, our proposed language, and that's just one alternative. Um, and again, what we're proposing here is based on what we believe is the most legally defensible avenue. There's certainly a whole lot of avenues to go, um, but our eye was really toward um, just that legal issue um, element. So in the current criteria, there's a little bit of a question of how the criteria is actually applied. And you'll see that in the underlying language, the and or language. You don't have to get into the nuts and bolts of it, but all that to say is that we propose to clarify this to make it clear that to get into historic preservation, you not only have to have an age requirement, you also have to have a requirement that the property be historically significant in some manner. And so we go into some specifics on what historical significance actually means, and you have to check at least one of those boxes along with the age requirement to get in, to be designated. And we've also clarified that um, this process will run similar to your current rezoning process, with the exception that instead of the Planning Commission, you have the Historic Preservation Commission hearing the issue first, and Council will be the one ultimately deciding on the issue. We've also added some requirements for non-consensual designation. Non-consensual designation is um, when a property owner isn't bringing the application forward themselves. The property owner isn't the one saying, I want to be a part of the Historic Preservation District, someone else's. Um, and so in those situations, there's a current percentage of um, property owners that must be um, signed on to the application for it to be able to be put forward for the application to be accepted. And so what we've proposed, proposed is to elevate that percentage slightly. I think that's it for this one. We'll talk about the HPO and what that means in just a moment. Um, so today you, well now you do, but before this process we didn't have this map. We weren't, um, we had a list of designated properties but we didn't have the map. So as a part of this process, staff has done an excellent job of mapping out all of the historically designated properties as it stands today. So those red dots are the actual properties, what's known as a landmark for historic preservation purposes. And those green, blue, and purplish -ish color are your historic districts. Those are national districts. Sorry, national districts, that's the point. Yeah, so those are, yeah. So going back to that federal process under the Historic Preservation Code, the state was the one to administer this process and create those districts through the federal regulations rather than the local regulations. Those shaded areas, the green, blue, and purple. Okay, so we just talked about the actual criteria, how you're eligible to get in but we want to talk a little bit about the actual mechanics of the process. Um, so as I just stated previously, there was um, no mapping exercise associated with designation. It was just a list of parcels. Um, staff's done a great job of mapping those parcels. And what we're proposing to do is actually create a new district, which would be a Historic Preservation Overlay District, or HPO. 
And the reason we're choosing um, to go about it this way, it's certainly not the only way to do it, but we think it alleviates some of the notice concerns and some of the concerns around um, how historic preservation can act a little bit differently than your typical zoning mechanisms even though most property owners probably um, don't have an excellent idea of that distinction. If they're looking for what regulations apply to their property, they're probably going to go to the zoning map, look at their zoning district, and then look at the regulations for that zoning district. That seems to make the most sense for most folks. But what they wouldn't see is if they were designated in that process. So we're proposing to change that, integrate the historic preservation regulations into the current LDC, your land development code. And with that would be this district, it would be in your list of overlay districts. That means it's superimposed on the base zoning district. We're not doing any rezoning. It's a mapping exercises of what you saw on that previous slide. It would come into the zoning map. So what you saw on that previous slide would come into the zoning map. It would be designated as a historic preservation overlay district. Any future designation would also be considered a part of that HPL. I think that's all I want to say about that. And again, we can come back to any of this. I know I'm kind of zooming through all of this, but we really want to have a lot of time to talk with you guys today and discuss um, the general parameters of um, these big issues. So we have this slide here just to show you how it could work in practice if we created this historic preservation overlay. And it would look just like your Terry Lake overlay. It would be superimposed on um, the zoning map and you would see it on the zoning map. So it would show up um, here, which is like a historic area, you'd be able to see whether or not you have historic preservation regulations attached to your property. Um, okay, the red line doesn't show up very well. Is the red line the... It's the... LDBA. Yeah, that's, that's the LDBA, but where is, where, where is the area you're talking about? So it's not actually mapped yet. I just show you this slide to show that it would, this is how it would be mapped. Um, it would be on the zoning map. It would show up as a district in the legend. Just under that Terry Lake overlay, you could see an HPO, historic preservation overlay. And once you go through that mapping exercise, this is where you would see it. So today you don't. <laughs> I don't see the Terry Lake overlay either. <laughs> Which I should. Right it's, down here at the bottom. It's not a. So that was a confusing <laughs> right. That was a confusing way to say that we're proposing to integrate this work preservation regulations into your land development code. You'd be able to see on the zoning map whether or not you're in that historic preservation overlay. So all in one place, you'd see your base zoning district and those standards. You'd see if any overlay applied to you as well and those standards. <clears throat> and now I'll turn it over to Glenn and he'll talk about some of the implications of this designation process. Right. Yeah, and I think this is probably the bulk of what uh, the Historic Preservation Commission wants to discuss. But as Austin mentioned, as we tighten up the criteria and we require that HPO in order to enforce um, historic preservation requirements, we have some conflicts with the way we've been doing it since um, close to the beginning of time. And the first one is really has to do with demolitions. We have a criteria basically it has to be 50 years old and it has to meet one of a couple of different criteria. And then if somebody comes in to do either a partial or a full demolition of their structure, a member of staff sits down with a council member and reviews that application and decides whether it's approved or not approved. Probably should fall under the purview of the HPC to some degree, um, but that's not the way it's set up now. The other conflict is um, they're not designated properties. So um, as Austin and Tossi mentioned, we want a legally defensible code, and that would mean we'd go through the process of um, the historic preservation overlay to put it in place and then the demolition regulations would apply. Um, there is some flex, well I won't say flexibility yet, but there's other ways to look at that. Um, one way is in order to, and I think the HPC would say, there are some beautiful buildings that haven't been designated, certainly could be, if the landowner would agree to it 
and then there could be a level of preservation involved. So um, staff could make a concerted effort to identify those buildings and reach out to the landowner and compel them, maybe that's too strong of a word, but provide carrots to hopefully get them to either um, designate it as a landmark or come in as a district. Um, there may be another way that if you look at the scale of legal defensibility with the HBO being at the highest end, um, the, the, what I just described would probably be really close because you're not forcing anybody to do anything. You're just giving them carrots to, to um, come in. Would be um, if we did a code amendment and we tightened up the criteria and we said, okay, if you're 75 years old and you meet these criteria and you're within the original town site of Longmont um, potentially we could then control demolitions to a certain end there that we have to do a whole lot more work but there is on that scale there are some opportunities um, <coughs> creation of new districts and landmarks I, I think Austin mentioned it it's really what we're doing now except now we're calling it a zoning process um, HPC is reviewing it. They're making a recommendation. City Council's adopting an ordinance. And in this case, staff would then put it on the map so somebody would know that their property is uh, designated. And all those red dots you saw on the map before, they would automatically become um, HBO um, districts because we've gone through that process. They've been notified so we can all, all immediately incorporate them into the ordinance. Um, so it's really no different than what we're doing other than we're calling it a zoning process and we're doing the notification and we're putting it on the map. Um, we've talked about new design guidelines and um, staff brought that forward and council approved um, a budget to adopt design guidelines. Um, as we've designated it now, that would only apply to the HBO areas. Um, but we know um, the like historic east side neighborhood has some concerns about um, incompatible structures or architecture. Um, there would be another way, um, again, following kind of the same scale for reviewing demolitions where um, staff could uh, reach out and hopefully compel somebody to join a district or join a landmark or we can adopt an overall um, section in our code, perhaps, like the industrial design guidelines that we presented to you last week. It, it, these are conceptual design guidelines that apply to every industrial building. It would be the same way here, perhaps, um, within the original town site or whatever that criteria is. A little bit off the scale of legal defensibility, um, but in, in the realm of possibilities. So, there's some possibilities um, for that. Non-conceptual designations, it's kind of a loose process right now. Basically, staff can meet with HPC and, and decide, um, maybe we should designate this property. You make a recommendation to city council, and then city council decides whether we go through a formal process to do that. Um, I think what we're talking about now, which I think would be the better way, is we follow that process and we require some additional levels, whether um, I think we're saying if it's a district, there should be 50% of the people within that district that agree um, we should designate this as a historic district. Um, so in one way, the other 50% are maybe not, are coming along, um, um, maybe not kicking and screaming, but they're, we don't have to get full consent. Um, but again, it's up to the city council to agree. Um, removal of designations. This is something also in the code where somebody can petition um, staff, and I believe it does go to HBC, and it could be for economic reasons. It could be that a portion of the structure is burnt. Um, it could be for a number of reasons. They want to remove that designation. Um, and what I think we're going to propose is tightening up those standards of when somebody can um, remove themselves from their uh, landmark or their district designation 
And one of the reasons we um, have talked about is if uh, there's a good reason for attainable and affordable housing. Um, so I'll kick it back to uh, um, Austin, who's been asked to look in some of these areas. Thanks, Glenn. Um, that's a good segue into this conversation. We know it's a really big one. Um, and so I guess I'll say at the forefront, if it feels that you guys just don't have the necessary information tonight, we're happy to come back with more options. We're happy to come back with a separate presentation just on this issue to explore how we can balance um, the affordable and attainable housing goals with the historic preservation goals. Like I said at the outset, you know, I think part of what's embedded in historic preservation is the preservation of land. And as a part of that, you typically get benefits economically. It typically means you have higher land values. If you're in a historically designated district, your price of land just got higher. And so I think that's something just fair to say. And I think most historic preservation folks um, would agree on that part. Maybe not, I'd like to hear um, their thoughts. But all of that to say, this is, th these goals I think can absolutely be balanced. We're throwing um, a couple of options out there tonight. Um, just for discussion purposes, this is by no means all of the options out there. Um, but really we wanna hear um, from all of you um, how best to strike this balance, how how this balance um, would be best strike for the city. So this is just for discussion purposes, um, and we can come back to this, but we've shown some examples there on the slide um, just for discussion purposes. But um, Before we get there, I think we can go ahead and finish up the rest of the talk on the procedures related to historic preservation, and at the end, we'll come back to um, all of these topics and discuss whatever you all would like to discuss. So the certificate of appropriateness process is something unique to historic preservation. And what it does is a process that is required for historically designated structures um, before that structure or that designated property um, does typically any sort of exterior, exterior work. So it's another um, procedural step that you have to follow if you're a designated um, property. And the reason for that is to ensure that the exterior change isn't aligned with the character of the historic district or landmark. So right now, there's one process for certificate of appropriateness and a separate process for demolitions. And I think Glenn did a great job of describing the current demolition process. What we're proposing um, is to separate the certificate of appropriateness process out into two processes, one major and one minor. The major would absorb the demolition permit, and so you would be required to get a major certificate of appropriateness if you were seeking a demolition of a designated structure. That would require um, HBC hearings and city council hearings. And the minor certificate of appropriateness would be a streamlined process for more minor um, alterations to a designated property. And we can get into some examples of what that looks like, but it um, would be very flushed out. I think last time I incorrectly stated you could just replace a window with a minor certificate of appropriateness, but that's actually not true, even as we've discussed it. It would have to be um, uh, the replacement of a window either with a historic replica or a window that is has no historic value, so one that's already been replaced in the last 10 years, say. It's just an example of how that's more fleshed out. So it's very specific criteria that allows you to get a streamlined certificate of appropriateness so you can get that work done to your historic structure. And then maintenance requirements. This is something we heard um, quite a bit about um, when we first started this conversation with historic preservation. Um, and I was not even a part of it, but we read all of the drafts from historic preservation. And there was some concern that some properties might do something um, called demolition by neglect, meaning you would let your property become so dilapidated that it would be then eligible for a permit for demolition. And so, We've gone through this, or gone about this in a couple of different ways. We're proposing to instead add maintenance requirements that would act as your baseline. So all designated properties would have to be maintained in a similar manner to which when the property was initially designated. And then we've added criteria to that major CA, the Certificate of Appropriateness, to ensure that properties that were intentionally neglected wouldn't be eligible for that um, demolition. They wouldn't be eligible to obtain that CA and instead they'd be forced to maintain their property to 
habitable standards as it was before. So that's the maintenance requirements, and this is the last thing I'll say. I know I've been talking a lot, um, and then we'll kind of go through an overview of um, everything we talked about and focus on whatever you all would like to talk about. This was another um, issue raised by the Historic Preservation Commission some time ago. Right now, on the left, you have the injunctive and equitable relief available for violations of the Historic Preservation Code. Again, we're trying to align this with the LWC, so what we've done is brought in the enforcement violations that are currently available under the Land Development Code, and then added two that would be specific to historic preservation. And those would entail folks that are really trying to cheat um, the designation process, or cheat the certificate of appropriateness process by assessing penalties in the way of not allowing building permits for a certain time period. Um, if that property owner did some alteration or demolished their property um, without getting that correct approval, then they wouldn't be eligible for that building permit for some period of time. So essentially delaying their construction. Those are just options. Um, certainly nothing has been decided, nothing we've discussed has been decided. We're just um, excited to talk about these issues with all of you. And feel that it's kind of easier to talk about them when you have some sort of proposal in front of you. So all that to say, um, we're happy to hear um, all of your thoughts, questions, comments. Again, this is these are the main slides or main issues we discussed today, just in the way of background. I have a question about the HPO. You guys said uh, at several points that it was really going to apply to that original like one mile square of the old town. Is there a process to have additional areas of the city added or have their own HPO? Great question. So let me clarify. It will act just like any other overlay district. So no matter where you are in the city, if you meet the criteria for designation and you go about the approval process that the council approves after an HPC hearing, then you are eligible to um, be designated in the HPO. So we use the town, the original town site, as kind of an example as those properties that are probably most likely to be designated, but not to say that there's others around. Just a quick follow up on that. So, would the HBO include, in essence, the original town site as a whole, or only? You're talking about only the cherry that have gone through property the current designation each process. Of the property locally. into that HBO one at a time. Right? Great. So, all of the properties that have already been designated locally, you could just bring in through an ordinance approved by the town council. No additional process. You could just bring them into this ordinance and map them on the zoning map. Any future designation would have to go through the designation process we talked about. They would have to meet the criteria and be approved by it. So it's your tying the HBO to a landmark, essentially, to a mobile landmark. Not necessarily. So it could be a landmark or it could be a district. It's really more of a mapping and zoning exercise than it is a substantive change. But you're right, we don't have any district. We don't have any local districts right. today. <laughs> I would also like to gently add um, in your nice overlay of you know, federal, state, local, um, a lot of the state register stuff has been left out. I'm not aware of any specific property that is not either designated locally or federally that's not, that's you know, separate on the state register. But we want to make sure that we were capturing all of that moving forward. So, and that's information that's helpful to share. Easy enough for us to <laughs> yeah, um, could you go back to the slide with the pink, yellow, and blue? <laughs> Not that one, but the one before that. It's less confusing. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you said we don't have any districts right now, but on that map, you've got three areas that say they are districts. Are they or aren't they? And what's the because I don't think we've really defined what a district is, and there's a second piece of, there's a second usage of the word district that confused me, and I think it was what you were getting at, but really, are those three bright colored ones districts or not? They're not local districts. Okay. They're designated under the state regulations. So those are state districts, and the, um, and the local overlay district that you are proposing is not contiguous in any way, but rather it's a little square drawn around every single dot on the map. 
Because okay. I don't think you said that. Right. Yes. The only the landmarks are would get HBO immediately. Okay. It would be up to going through the process for any future districts. Okay. Um, Except it. so, just to clarify that, so we do have three national register districts. Those would be continuous blocks. Thank you. Right. So it would no. They would have to go through the designation process in the local ordinance. So could we recommend doing very similar to what the state does, and that if something is listed at the national or state level, that we automatically list it as a city so that we don't have to do it as a separate process? You can automatically do it. You'd have to go through your designation process, but that's part of the benefit of the HBO, is that if you wanted to map these exact um, state blobs <laughs> to state right. districts, you could use the HBO to do that and get those exact lines the same and bring them into your local ordinance. You'd have to have hearings, there'd have to be a notice period. Pam, what status does that give to the homes that are in a state district but not are not a long landmark and therefore not in the proposed overlay district? Um, because the residents of those homes will have different opinions on whether they want to be in the overlay district or not. Right. And what what are their rights and not and and constraints? I mean, maybe that's you guys probably already know that. Except that I don't know whether the overlay district would cause a change in that. Well, the main advantage is through grants. Um, yeah. And, I'm sorry, and tax, and tax credits, right? So, if somebody wanted to upgrade their facade, they potentially could get tax credits and, and grants through the state. So, it's primarily a carrot system to maintain it. And the city, as well, has um, we uh, allow um, building permits to be reduced and those fees to be reduced for a landmark or for a change to a landmark. Um, so going back to incorporating these, <laughs> so there is a very long process and a really large amount of review that goes into a National Register District. Um, at the state, when we go through that entire process, um, when I say we automatically make it a State Register District as well, we take it to our board and say, hey, the review board, the keeper in Washington, have all decreed that we should be national register. We recommend they get put on the state register. And then they are. There's not additional hearings. Um, if we can do that at the local level, I would recommend that because I think that would save a lot of staff time and other folks' times instead of redoing hearings that have already been done. The time can you just add to that? Um, I just want to clarify. You said you have to if you have to go through a hearing process, but you're saying you'd have to go through a hearing process based on what the new code would be. Not, I mean, the city council can adopt whatever it wants. So that if this idea seems to be a more efficient and appropriate way to do it, they can just adopt that, and then future changes would have to go through a hearing process. But there's nothing in the city code now that we're going to So I don't let me just real quick. Um, with regard to our city code, one of the one of the recommendations that we're making is to bring this historic preservation into our land development code. And our land development code currently does have public hearing process in place. And so certain applications require public hearing and notice and then others don't that can be handled administratively by our director. And so in this instance, you know, if we um, wanted to cut down on local hearings, um, we would have to make sure that there are exceptions written into the land development code to allow for that. Well, so currently as it's written. It's a city council decision. Just, Correct. Just wanted to clarify that these are, this could all be part of a, of a massive piece of work, which includes a one-time uh, fix to the land development code for this one-time changeover process. And that doesn't mean that it should be how it's done all the time. Just at least that one. I want to go back to, if I could, to the attainable slide. Because um, you said, and I was expecting when you got to the end, you said you're going to come back to that. Are you coming back later in the, 
day or I I just spent can you come I, back to it now? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. I just spent as far as it's interesting or you guys would like to discuss it, but wanted to make sure it's your meeting and not Well this is a I think this is a very good deal. Right. Uh, and I'd be interested in what your thoughts were of the three points and then yeah. see what people yeah, I can talk about these just for um, a couple of minutes, just to explain what these options are. Again, this is um, just a couple of options, but you could do things that support um, attainable housing, like allow 80 years without additional approval. So basically saying that even though your designated property, we're not gonna enforce um, the design standards or any um, additional standards on the development of an EDU. And so it'd be an exception to the general rule, essentially, that a new construction in a designated district would typically require a different process, um, but it, that you could bring that out and have it as an exception. You could also allow for the conversion, if you took it a step further, of a designated property, a property, oh, sorry. No. Oh, well, no, you can finish answering him. I, I just was getting in line. <laughs> <laughs> So you could allow for the conversion of a property um, into something a little bit more dense, like some sort of flux, um, if certain standards are met to preserve the exterior of the structure. So if you're just working at the interior um, and changing the density um, and going from a single family dwelling use to something of higher density, you could allow for some um, uh, procedural streamline, essentially, for those types of conversions. Um, and then this would be obviously a lot, um, a lot more on the side of attainable and affordable housing, but you could allow a complete off-ramp um, from historic preservation um, properties, properties that are designated if that property owner enters into a development agreement and agrees to, for instance, deed restrict the new construction um, for affordable and attainable housing. Those are some options I've seen in other communities. Um, but there's, there's quite a lot more out there. But it gives you a flavor of how you go about it. So these bullet points about ADUs, the first two, apply very easily in certain cases and are very difficult to apply in other cases. So if you've got a yard and you can build an ADU in your backyard and you can't see it from the front, there shouldn't be any issues with putting an, e an ADU back there because it doesn't change the character of the neighborhood. But uh, 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 a second story on a garage, over a garage can be an ADU, and um, a basement entrance can be an ADU, or a duplex conversion. Um, I don't know how you tell those two apart. Um, and, you know, again, adding a second story over part of the, part of the building, if you call it an ADU, is that a bit? Because there are some examples of this, you know, in the Historic West site where they've added a, a second story on the back half of the building and completely changed the look of the house. Um, so, how, how, what are you thinking in terms of how, how that would be applied? Because, you know, I'm a big proponent of increasing density, but. Um, you know, you can make a mess. Yep. Well, I think the future design guidelines would help ease it in. Um, I think that would go a long ways. Um, and in some cases, it could be so specific that it'd be something even done at a stack level and not necessarily bringing in HPC. So, bullet point number three, we already had pushback on this from the uh, historical east side that a new building, regardless if it's affordable, attainable housing, does not preserve the uh, integrity of the neighborhood. So I would like to put the section on the second bullet point that says that aim to preserve the exterior structure. Something similar in the third bullet point that the exterior structure must, um, I don't know, uh, reflect the historical value of the neighborhood. Um, otherwise, you will destroy the district. Right. So um, I think that's important. And to Marsh's point on the first bullet point, 
um, if we just put that in the code, then the ADU, the addition of an ADU per our code now doesn't have any kind of, um, I guess, requirements for what that looks like. But I do think in a historical district, regardless, it, it still has to fit in with the historical value of the neighborhood. Otherwise, it could be a barn. I mean, or just, uh, you know, I mean, the look of. A barn could be technically. <laughs> <laughs> with yeah. Well, let me say that. Yeah. It could just be something very different than what was there before. Is all designed? Go with the, the design standards? I think they would, which we've been kind of asking. So, uh, I'm here as a, an HBC commissioner, but I wear another hat where I really advocate for affordable housing. And I think the first one and the last one are terrible ideas in this context. <laughs> um, you know, I think if, because especially, because right now what you're proposing is that the HBO is just landmark properties, which I, on another note, I don't know that we're, is, is enough. But if we're talking about you have a landmark property, then you should go up in front of the HBC if you want to alter that property. Here, it doesn't mean you can't do it in you, or you should go through the 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 you should go through the HBC. It's the whole point of having a sort of preservation commission because because it's not just residential design guidelines. It's a whole bunch of other criteria that's set up by the Secretary of Interior. Or they have a whole federal. There's a reason why there are professionals on your your. HBC because it's it's more complicated, um, and, and then allowing you know the few historic properties that we have and landmark out you know to, to not be a landmark just to provide housing just seems like we're I mean, there's, there are other ways to provide housing. So, so I, I I would push back pretty hard on that. I would also really like us to avoid any like language or messaging that somehow historic preservation and affordable housing and more density are mutually exclusive. And I think that as a community, we can find ways to meet both without um, without sacrificing historic preservation and so vulnerable to color. And I think that's a point like we would love your guys' expertise on um, <coughs> finessing some either processes or standards that get us there. I also say that what you're proposing as, as part of the overlay with this HBO feels like a, is, is a good way to clean up what we have now and bring it into land use code so it's all in one place, but it's also pretty much a lateral move in terms of protecting neighborhoods. And, and, and I, want, I would like City Council to understand, at least from what, what we have heard, and you've probably heard some of it from the east side as well, is that a, a lot of the concern, and I know there's one commissioner who's not here who sent me a long email expressing his concern, so I'm partly speaking for, for Commissioner Jacoby as well, um, is you know, a concern about the, these small scale original town site neighborhoods and the, the, the size and scale of those, and there are properties that might be worthy of a designation but aren't designated if they're eligible for just being demolished or you know greater density and height. And at some point, do you want to protect the neighborhoods, the smaller original town site neighborhoods in terms of their scale um, in, in a way that's a little broader than just identifying what we already have and saying this, you're only, you're only in this HBO if you're already landmark. That, that's not going to be enough. That's not what I know the public has come to our meetings is looking for, just for whatever that's going So maybe for me, um, a clarification on what a, a, a historic district is versus if you're saying it is only certain uh, homes within an area rather than the whole area. This, this is where I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. When you go back to that red, blue, and, nope, one more, there. Mm -hmm. So each of those dots is a designated district, you said. Locally. But is it is it one home? 
typically. So how can one home be a district? It, so it would be in a district, like a, as a part of the zoning map. Okay. And so it's more nomenclature than anything. So I think the confusing part is that calling it the historic preservation district, and then you have historic districts within that. Yes. Um, and so with so the historic preservation overlay district could be one individual property. Like all of those red dots would be, as proposed, a part of the historic preservation overlay district, even though none are a historic district unto themselves. Although you do have groupings of them that you could probably make a neighborhood out of or close to. I guess my frustration, and this might go to your point in a way, is that if those homes are in a neighborhood mm -hmm. and they have historic designation, like the three that are grouped there in the green, but the homes around them do not have any historic designation, will they be able to build an ADU to the specifications of a developer or to the specifications of the uh, CA or whatever? That, that's where I'm a bit confused. So, because if we're preserving historic neighborhoods, then that's where I'm a little confused. The district should be perhaps the neighborhood, not. Yeah, just to follow up on Mary's point, your legend over there refers to those dots as historic landmarks, not historic districts. Right. Which yeah. is correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then the district is everything in blue. For instance, is the downtown historic district. That's not what it's proposing. I know, but that's yeah. but that's what it exists. <laughs> on the state level. So we have the state Do level. I try? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So the red dots are, are individual houses or buildings that we in La Oman have said this individual house is also a red dot list. Mm -hmm. These the pink block, the blue block, blah, blah, the green block. Yes. We, we said it because the state has a no, sir. No, 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 the no, no, the no, 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 has been identified as having a historic relationship that is important and so it was deemed a district and a bunch of the buildings and houses within it are listed. Not everything is because you have to have homeowner consent and not everybody within the district wants to be on the national register. So those are the things that I was recommending to kind of keep everything tidy that as a city um, we might want to go ahead and also automatically our local designations so we don't have weird confusions like we have today. And, and Glenn, this goes to um, the question that I asked you and you only answered the first half. Sorry. So, um, <laughs> the, because uh, I was really asking about the houses that are within a national district but are not like, designated as landmarks and um, what constrains them, what constraints are they under even though they never have applied, just because they're in that national district? I don't think there's any constraints on that. Planning, yeah. no, okay. The regular, yeah. the regular planning. Right. Yeah, the, yes, for, the but, but not for the historic right. district, right. just for the zone that they're in. Like, right. Yeah, That's yeah. right. You're, you're is, just missing out on tax credits and, and grants, basically. But it's also on certain expenses to maintain the property. Yeah. Right, which is what I was, I was saying. One of the things you mentioned was a 50% buy-in to be the district, and you're suggesting that the city council could just do it, but then isn't that? Isn't no, ma'am. So okay. what I'm suggesting is that those individual blobs have already been through the whole public process where people have had the ability to opt in or not. Yes. So, and then it's gone through the National Review Board. That's a, a, a state board. Um, and then gone through the approval process from Washington. And so um, I would think that all those public aspects have been met. And so only the ones that were, even if they're within the blob, only the homeowners who had agreed to be part of the national or state district would then automatically be approved. You wouldn't. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm not a proponent of um, uh, forceful 
I forget words, it's too late, right, of the, the forceful. Um, no, that's right. And I, and I yeah. would agree with that. No, I, would, I, would yeah. Yeah. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, and then I would suggest, too, at the very beginning when you were talking about um, current, how to be designated versus proposed, mm -hmm. it seemed like you're making it harder to be designated. And I don't think that's what we wanted. Um, in the case of non-consensual designations, well, yes. Non-consensual, yes. I which would, I would which is almost always in every district. Yes. And so if you go back to the <laughs> plot. I would not ever agree to that. <laughs> but, but for consensual, I don't want to make it harder. I want to make right. it easier. I want to throw in more carrots even. Which that process that is almost harder. like a direct carryover. The process oh, okay. of it consensual designation is pretty much a carryover. But the non-consensual process is much more difficult, but to be clear, almost always a district. So if you made like a new blob somewhere over here, you would almost always have some property owners that do not want to be a part of that district, forcing it into the non-consensual process. Does that make sense? I don't, I mean, what would the... It makes sense, yeah, because <laughs> we require 50%. So if just one says no, then you're forced into that other process, the non-consensual process. But that's to make it into a district, but not to designate your home. And exactly right. Redistricting happens all the time to homeowners, but to designate a home, that elevates what needs to be done to that home to the point where you're right. really affecting private property values versus, I mean, there is some effect with, with, with planning and zoning and changing zoning rules, but a district, it sounds like, to me, maybe I'm wrong, um, you could have you could create that district over there, but until you designate your home as being special for that district, it, the HPC is mostly out of it. If it was a local district, you would be in it. Yeah, anything would come to you within that district. Now, what a lot of cities do is they do a real detailed survey, and they say this is a contributing structure. This is an important landmark potentially. Mm -hmm. But this is non-contributing. Mm -hmm. It's maybe been changed over over a period of time. So you have more latitude to do things with that non-contributing, and you would look much careful, much more carefully at the Yeah, so then I would go back to uh, this non-consensual designation. I don't know what you mean. I think to your point, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I will just own that I am probably the least familiar with uh, historic preservation, the challenges, and so Shakita and I. So as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm trying to understand as I'm listening to the conversation, what are the problems we're trying to solve? Because that was that's not real explicit to, explicit to you, not to me. So I think I've heard legal defensibility mm -hmm. is a problem we're trying to solve. Uh, that uh, we need uh, demolition approval process and responsibilities redefined. So it's not a council member in the chair. That's right. Um, affordable, additional affordable and affordable housing is a problem for the city we need to solve, whether we do it here or not. But what you're suggesting is that this may present the possible, a possibility in terms of solution. Um, that we have, we don't have maintenance requirements as problems. Are there more problems? Uh, you don't have to answer that now, but it will be helpful, Glenn. Maybe I need a tutorial session on, yeah, here are the other problems, Tim. I've heard solutions, creating new districts and landmarks, applying uh, new designation guidelines, tighter non-consensual designation process with whatever that percentage is, uh, removal of designations uh, potentially as a solution, and the creation of maintenance requirements. What I, what I don't know, still, I saw a reference to goals. I haven't seen a goal statement. You said balancing goals. I don't know what they are. I didn't see a goal statement. If there's a goal, it'd be helpful to have it articulated as a goal. Um, I don't know if enforcement is a problem or a solution in this case. So it'd be helpful to know if, if it's a problem or a solution in, in, in what's that balance. I'm not certain. I have to be really helpful to, for somebody to, to like, kind of lay out if these are the options, if these are the solutions, here are the new problems we can anticipate because we're hearing some reference to that. We have gotta be prepared to identify and have solutions, strategies, or options. Um, so I, so it would be helpful for me as a neophyte, not to counsel, but to historic preservation to have some of those details fleshed out. Mm -hmm. 
I don't yeah. know. I'll, I'll yield to Shakita if there are other questions, or you know, for, as, as another neophyte in the room. That's okay. right. Mm -hmm. um, I totally agree with everything that you're asking. Um, I took some of the same notes of what you took down. Um, back to what you were saying, it makes a lot of sense um, referencing the problems that we don't see. You know, um, it makes sense to go ahead if that that area, that national area has already been designated as a historic district, um, why couldn't we just transition those, automatically um, approve those areas um, or those landmarks, right? Um, I think I'm, I wanna make sure that I have a clear understanding as to the, the local, the HPOs, the overlay ones. Um, in the areas that we see them dispersed. So once they decide, okay, so they're the HPOs, um, what happens if we then want to have a district over there? So what happens then, right? Um, and back to Marsha saying, asking about the neighborhoods, if you have five in one area that's not part of the national, um, what if that area come to you all and say, we want to be a district, um, part of the national district, or have so that because they want the entire neighborhood to be that historical district, you know, to have that characteristic. So I guess that's my one of my concerns, including with what um, Tim was saying as well. I was, I was just wondering because there were some areas that had more than one or two in them, and then so what happens then, you know, moving forward. And then you also mentioned the land code, right? So um, what does that look like when everything is switched over with the land development code? Um, what are some of those challenges as well? Yeah. Well, it, it would be a whole new set of regulations that would be in addition to all the other regulations in the land development code. You're in a designated property, that means there's these requirements as far as demolition, going through historic preservation to get a certificate of appropriateness. I mean, all those rules then kick in. Yeah, but, but those are rules that exist. I mean, you want to yes. see them and include, right? right? I mean, there are actual Yeah, we're just moving them into another section of the code. So it's not like it's all new. This isn't all new. No. A lot of this is just reorganization. you were saying. Just yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's chilling. Um, well, so uh, back to the idea of goals. Uh, obviously, you turn to this slide, so these are the goals. goals. And I, so, I think I, there's eight that you currently list. But, sorry. <laughs> I know who you is, because it doesn't mean. <laughs> sorry to say. <laughs> so these read like goals, okay, protect the historic character of the city. I don't think anyone would disagree with that one. Um, the enhancement of property values and stabilization. Let's just stop with the enhancement of property values. You know, I get complaints about things the city does regularly that say, I don't want you to do this because it's going to decrease my property values. And what I say to them is, you know, changes in city policy or for the greater good of the city and your investment in your property is just that an investment and it's not the job of the city to protect your property values if it says that then people are going to argue with me about also about not necessarily that. have property values work the real estate appraiser yes yeah. not exactly how they work yeah, yeah. We, we certainly don't have any any um, way of advancing or decreasing property values. And again, this was taken from the current code. These aren't <laughs> things we're changing. Yeah, um, that's but, kind of change. But well, we should fix it while we're at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if some of the historic preservation commissioners want to speak to maybe some of the arguments that there could be for these purposes. Also, I can touch oh, on some, just yeah. based on my experience with working as districts. Um, this probably stems from the fact that 
many times what the designated historic districts and historic preservation codes were in response to neighborhood decline, to disinvestment in older neighborhoods. Uh, and historic preservation was used as a tool, or ordinances that were used or have been used as a tool to help halt and stem neighborhood decline. And a lot of that decline had to do with inappropriate conversions of homes to multifamily um, structures. And I personally had a house that I undid <laughs> some damage to in that regard. Um, so it, it goes back to a lot of the historic purposes, the fact that our zoning codes didn't always respect that um, older neighbors had developed at a different time and were functionally illegal under under more suburban zoning codes. So that's really where the property value comes in. It's really a historic, it, I mean, it's a historic perspective of historic preservation, if that makes any sense. But it really comes back to the fact that these were neighborhoods that were declined at one point, and they were trying to protect properties from being demolished to put in an appropriate buildings. So that's just context. So that's a good context, and it means that we should reword that because it's not to preserve the property values, it's to enable the homeowner to preserve the historic character of their own property, which they may not, wouldn't be able to afford to do if there were not special protections or that way or landmarks. But that is a scary phrase. It's, it's common. In fact, zoning too, but it's often a preamble in zoning that's there to protect property values, but it makes me cringe a little bit too. Mm -hmm. Wish it fixed it everywhere. I think the second part, the stabilization of the historic yeah. neighborhoods is really where the yeah. important part is. That, that's the important part of it, and mm -hmm. that's what we're hearing. So in a, in, a, in a worst case scenario, under the current proposal, you could imagine anything that's not a red dot could get theoretically raised with whatever structure built without any purview of the Historic Preservation Commission even being aware of it, it would all be regulated by the land use code only. And, and so that, I think, I, I mean, on behalf of at least myself and what, what I've heard and, and maybe one other commissioner, I don't think that's, that's what, not what we were seeking when we started this process of, hey, we should really take a look at this demolition code. We were seeking some, some level of protection for these neighborhoods as a whole that doesn't, doesn't elevate to the standard of a landmark. We're not asking for every home in, this, in these neighborhoods to have to meet these landmark criteria where, the, where, you know, where they have to, where they're just really, because those folks are opting to put further restrictions on themselves in, in order for their own benefit because they love the house, because they love the sort of preservation, because they want to get tax credits, they're opting for higher restrictions. But we're, our feeling is there ought to be another, a, a, a lesser, but still more than now, tier that, that protects the neighborhood as a whole. Which was my question about the district versus your individual dots. Um, and that third bullet point, if you are asking for to have absolutely no ADUs um, in the historic de designated homes, well then that, th that third bullet point doesn't work because those designated homes, right, you know, go back to the one you were on, the goals, the goals, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Too many drivers. Uh, there you go. Um, they would not be able to increase the economic and financial benefits uh, of having an ADU on their home. Uh, and they, my fear is that if, unless that is the outset of one of the things that they need to know before they go into the process, Chances are they may not want to go into the process, or once they're in and find out they cannot put an ADU under their home, they may want to come back out of it and say. Could I have maybe respond to this? Yes, one? yes, please. Um, I think the concern that I heard was that, not that you couldn't do it, but that you could do it automatically. So there's the, currently, 
something like that requires process HPC yeah. and, and the question is what and there are several bright lines here which none which we I think to Tim's point we're not right. clear bright lines about this but there are certain things that would only require staff and then it could be done okay. certain things would require um, city council uh, which means the city council uh, getting the input from the HPC could be done but but the but the I think the, the bullet points that you had showed were that some things could be done automatically without HPC uh, involvement or without city council involvement and I think those those are where we need much longer discussion so, um, where, we, where we get a clear set of where the right lines are. Okay, I misunderstood what you said. Yeah, right. So okay. what I'm yeah. saying is, under a scenario where the yeah. district wants yeah. literally only the landmarks, right. we're, only, we're only going to provide this to the landmarks, then I would, then I would say we absolutely have to have. But then I would object, right? Because if we're talking about landmarks, if we're talking about neighborhoods, then I think it goes back to, to just letting the HPC review it. We had, we had a, an example of this a, a couple of years ago where somebody came in and wanted to put an ADU over their garage. And, and it was a historic a structure. And they wanted to blow it to smithereens. And we said no. And we said, this is what you ought to do. This is the, you ought to get, get, a, get basically told them, get a historic architect and, or somebody that knows this and come back with a different plan. And they did. And we approved it okay. because then it was appropriate. So we, we kind of guided the process. And, and the homeowner got an ADU, but, but the neighborhood got a more appropriate structure. Okay, I thank you for clarifying that. I, I totally misunderstood <laughs> what you had not said. Because those landmarks are already protected. I mean, the neighborhood isn't. And that's the whole gist of the <laughs> conversation. So, and that, that's, so to clarify for me again, does the overlay protect the neighborhood? No. The so I don't propose. Yeah, I don't Not as proposed. Okay. So like the overlay, to, yeah. all it does yeah. is, I think it was said well, it's a lateral move. It's a lateral move to bring your historic preservation regulations into your land development code, which means it needs to walk and act like a zoning district. And so that's a lot of what that discussion is. Just those red dots being essentially just mapped on the zoning map, but those districts, which again is a state process, they haven't gone through any local process, Correct. will remain the same under the state regulations, right. but they are currently not touched by local regulation. Well, and I would just say conjecture would be that if we were to try to bring in an entire neighborhood section with a bunch of uh, properties that are not historic landmarks, but almost immediately to my mind require a non-consensual designation process. Yes, that's exactly right. And, and I think part of the conversation is where we want to set that benchmark at, right? 50% or higher, even right. maybe, possibly, depending. And I, because I would say that separate from what I'm sure HPC has heard from HENA, the Historic Eastside Neighborhood Association, I've had meetings with, with those representatives as well, and they're looking at a much more neighborhood-based concept yes, yeah. with specific design standards, right? I think that's, you know, where I think this kind of disconnect here is, is a little bit. Yeah, yeah that area is shown on here as well. It's yeah. it's the lighter pink right. that surrounds. Well, as we right. see little dots in all, yes. many other neighborhoods. Yes. Like Kindly neighborhood just north of Ninth, and you see stuff below Third Avenue there. And uh, as we see the, the green west side historic district uh, exceeds the original town site, for instance, and into multiple different neighborhoods, if you will, Bone Farm. Warner's Orchard and the historic plus side, so. But don't we already kind of have a non-consensual zone in that one mile original block? Like, everybody within that block if they want to do something. Not that block, but that square, blue square, thank you. Have to come into HPC, but then the rest of the city is kind of left in this, not even a, a gray yeah. area. You're right. The way, yeah. this, the, way the current demolition code yeah. ever here is yes. written, if you're in the original town site, you're supposed to come to HPC. For demolition, right? Demolition. Just for demolition, right? But, so you, but you're taking that out right now in your proposal. Right. So we're losing some teeth. I just, yeah. I'm just no, trying to express that I think we're losing more than we're gaining. I mean, I think you're right as far as the demolition process goes. I didn't realize that. 
Yeah. Does the does the state uh, slash federal consortium that that defines the blue, the pink, and the green uh, do any monitoring or enforcement at all, or do they just give grants if you're in that area? There are designation is honorary only. There is no enforcement. You could put your house on the national register today, and you could pull those up tomorrow. However, you would not get all of those wonderful grants and other things that the federal government would provide. Um, it changes if you wanted to go in for a federal grant. Um, so even today, um, I was dealing with private homes in the Marshall Fire um, that are looking for HUD funds. And so we're, we are having to look at um, historic preservation issues to make sure things are in compliance. So um, that's where things get sticky, is if you want federal monies and you're in a historic home, then you got to follow that historic home. So. Um, the state said that uh, the state may not do it, but you can't bulldoze that home unless the because city. Because of local stuff. Because yes. of local. <coughs> local is where almost And the yeah. question that Steve's asked, and I think we're all interested in, the eventual <coughs> answer, and that's not, is when you talk about moving that out, of the, then what's, how's it replaced and is that going to accomplish this? I think we'd like to, I mean, it sounds like from what we heard tonight that there is um, definitely a desire to, um, for that blue square, maybe just those properties is what I'm hearing, that the HPC wants to hear <coughs> if those properties are proposed for demolition, even if they're not designated. Is that, am I getting that right? That's what you want. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. We but we wanted to expand that into other parts, if not the entire city. Right. right. Because, like, I live just outside of that blue square, and um, it's it's an old neighborhood. It's not officially historically designated yet, but we're seeing weird demolitions and weird pop tops and mm -hmm. things that will get out of hand really quickly if we don't. So I think we have our marching orders as far as that goes. I guess I would just say um, there were some legal issues that were brought to our attention with that process, and that's why that process was ultimately changed. But I think knowing that that is the policy direction that you want to see, we can propose something that hopefully gets you close. I can stop talking. <laughs> well, I just want to go, so real quick, the proposal for non-consensual is 50%. Is that the proposal? Just right. kind of, yeah, throw right. it in Because I know that council's conversation in our executive session was slightly different. I think we had, we were holding it to a slightly higher standard. If I remember yes. from our conversation, we were talking something a little bit 60 and above, I think. Okay. So, yeah. yes. so federal and state are 51% for okay. uh, districts. But again, that doesn't mean, you know, like the individual homes, like they opt out, they opt out. It could be slightly different, but there is precedent. Okay. I mean, that's something we want to hear for sure tonight. That you know, what number people seem to be most comfortable with. So, can I make a request? I don't. If you heard policy direction tonight, well, you've got way better listening skills than I do. <laughs> Could you summarize the pot? Not you. Could you summarize the policy direction and get it back to us? I'd like to know what you heard and what direction you think you're taking. Yeah. I'm not sure I have heard it. Yeah, no, I, I don't think we have either. I think I just meant to say if that's what we're here for tonight. We want to hear those those conversations. If it's a higher percentage than 50%, we'd love to talk about that. Yeah. And, and we wanted to make sure, obviously, that the HBC Council had the opportunity to exchange ideas rather than do this in separate meetings continually. So I think this is kind of our first inroad into the folks who are the professionals doing the work at HPC helping inform the process. Yeah. What I've heard is, oh, I'm sorry, no, no, no that's okay. Well, because what I've heard is, is we're not all clear on the definitions. It's hard to make policy when, like I didn't understand the district versus the landmarks. Um, right. And, I, and what that meant. So for me, this is more of a clarification of, of our policy now and the discussion of where do we want to go with it. Um, so, uh, she, no, I, yeah. I, I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, Councilmember Waters just kind of answered some of your questions and, and kind of loop everyone together. 
with regard to what the problem is that we're trying to solve. There are multiple, there are probably multiple more problems that are hidden, you know, yeah. hearing the committee, you know, we're coming to the realization that there are a little, there are a lot of little, you know, potholes that we can get stuck into. So um, demolition, yes, um, looking at the process of demolition currently, um, we proposed a major certificate of appropriateness um, as far as the affordable attainable housing, you know, like you said, it's a very large problem with probably a larger solution, and I'm not sure that we can solve that today with regard to how it relates to historic preservation. But what we'd like to do is, you know, I can assist um, Glenn in putting together some of the quote unquote concerns of area that we have, you know, maybe not as clearly highlighted tonight, but we can do that to highlight, uh, summarize those, and then go through and like um, Austin provided today, give some proposed solutions. So, you know, whether it's 50, 50, 51%, whether it's 60%, you know, we can um, kind of point those, point those out and maybe some of the issues with it. For example, you know, wanting to bring in, automatically bring in some of those national registers like the, the blue um, into our local, into our local historic, um, uh, bring in historically, uh, locally historic, what we can, one of the things that we need to look into is whether or not there's state statutes that require that we need to go still go through the public process even though they went through it at the federal level. And so there are little nuances like that that we would need to look into. And so, you know, there, there are unfortunately a lot of questions that are still lingering, but, you know, this is, every single question comes with additional, you know, information and every single, every single little thing that we hear, I mean, there's more problems or more concern, you know, areas of concern, but opportunities, opportunities there you go. And so what we'd like to do is, the way that our code is currently written, it's not as clear as it should be. Um, the definitions aren't as clear as it should be sometimes, you know. Um, some of the criteria with the 50, 50 year old, you know, it's, it's something that we can maybe add a little bit more flexibility, add a little bit more, um, uh, just give ourselves a little bit more flexibility in what to do, how to do it, especially if affordable attainable comes into play. And so, you know, what we can work on is putting together that statement, that summarization of policy goals, quote unquote, maybe what we've discussed today, but it's, I think it's going to be more areas of concern, not necessarily policy issues that we've heard, but areas of concern where we can, from there, go to some of the policy directions that staff is looking for. Um, we do have some ideas as to proposed language for the code amendments. Is that something that you would like to see as well? I would, especially, I and the rest of you need to chime in. Um, especially when you're talking about uh, looking at the neighborhood, the structure and the, the history of the neighborhood. Some, some, code, some code language on that so that they would have to go for any kind of development within that neighborhood, have it okay, rather than just have the, because it, it is not a landmark building, but it, to preserve the neighborhood, that needs to go before the uh, store. So possibly have it adhere to some of the newer design guidelines that Glenn mentioned. Yes, so and, okay. right, on, on every, every design. So, Rachel. Thank you, Joan. I, I, th I think that what has happened here is that um, there seems to have been an effort to put everything in the same category. And what I think you know, your, your analysis should be um, categorization by use case. So something about the current code now is it treats demolition differently than it treats everything else. And that is working. So you don't want to undo that. But, but it seems like you have three use cases or three categories of of buildings, the uh, um, you know buildings that are eligible for this demolition. You know, you have you have buildings that can be modified versus have to go through a process just to be modified, and then you have buildings that don't have any special de uh, designation at all, and and. I don't think it's appropriate to put those together because you're either going to miss an alert or you're going to drive everybody crazy um, with with having reviews. So um, whether you want to expand the, the must review on demolition uh, square or not, that's an appropriate square, and demolition is the only use case in it. On the other hand, uh, 
you know, you, you, if you want to do the overlay district, um, whether the overlay district includes the national districts as well as the historic landmarks to try to put them in one thing, well, again, you, you, need, to, you need to go and look at what the use cases are. If I am in a, a, the West Side Historic District and I want to build an ADU and I'm not a historic landmark, do we care enough about the character of the neighborhood that we're going to review your ADU application? You know, so Hannah, for example, would say yes, absolutely, you have to review that. A lot of the homeowners would say no, if I wanted that kind of review, I would uh, have applied to be a historic landmark. Um, so I, I think there's some, some use case analysis that needs to, to still be done before this goes to code. But I agree with that. But to your point about the west side, I think it was you and Kristen, is that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that um, ADUs and pop-ups are occurring that are not in line with the historic value of the neighborhood. So um, we do need to define that. Is it a district that we are looking at to uh, look at, to have the ADUs go to the Historic Preservation Commission first, or is it just a neighborhood? Um, that's a big ask. It's a big ask for the district, and it's a big ask for the neighborhood. So, I don't know how you write code for that, to be quite honest. Lynn, that's your job. <laughs> Somebody's well, job that works for it. Mayor Peck, I think what you're speaking to really is not that uncommon where a lot of cities have design guidelines for individual home and ADU review that actually don't have anything to do with historic preservation or city council, but they're specific design guidelines that are applied at either time of building permit or prior. So I think that is uh, perhaps a gap in some of our regulations that we do want to fill. And we're I think bring the historic into that. Right? Yeah, and I think that this conversation, at least in my mind, is helping me think through how we might do that more broadly. Okay. Um, in addition to the historic specific, I do think those types of alterations and new homes are occurring in other neighborhoods where people might like to see um, some additional continuity of design. Right. So you're talking about repeating whatever the facades and materials roof pitches those kinds of things is that that's what yeah i think okay. some of the broad design guidelines and again i my neighborhood in Longmont is very different than the historic okay. east side so like those two wouldn't be you know you wouldn't use the same design guidelines but i think you could certainly use similar elements by neighborhood which, which is a big lift it is but it's not uncommon i think we've all some of us worked in other cities that have had that, that's a pretty common occurrence. So when, uh, when a home wants to uh, put on an ADU, does planning and zoning know that if we go through this process that this home is in a historic overlay district, you would know that. We so, have that, yeah. Yeah, so that you would know different standards here, different design standards because of where they are, right. rather than, okay, that's, and the easy one is that original town site. Yes, absolutely. It's pretty well done. Okay, if we have nothing else, we have a meeting in six minutes. Yes. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Just to, to some of you, just a closing summary statement. What, what should we expect moving forward? Well, I think what we're going to come back with is a little bit more specific language. In this setting? Or um, we could certainly, this is ideal to have both of us here. It's, it's hard to coordinate, but um, I think it would be ideal that we come with more specific guidelines and what we're trying to solve with those. I think it's very helpful to have it. the city council and the HBC there because otherwise we're each guessing a little bit. Yeah. You know, as to what the others going to do. I think it makes it more difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually easier for us. Yeah, and we're getting more focused at those then. Well, so that's good. A whole lot of I wouldn't go so sir. far as <laughs> you're getting, I think you're getting a lot of ideas and a lot of and I, I'd ask this follow up with Tim, what, what's timeline will we expect our next meeting? 
We will look at your calendars. So we are, that will guide our timeline. And what, what um, Harold needs to put on the agenda before the end of the year. Right. Yes. Yeah. Or executive right. sessions to the meeting. So, uh, you know, I really like this because as council, when uh, the residents come up about historic uh, preservation issues on their neighborhood or their house, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so um, this, this has been great. So we have some ideas.